Thanks, Lyle. Um, I, <clears throat> I apologize in advance for my voice. Uh, for, I'm going to show you some pictures, and we'll talk about this project. And uh, hopefully, there'll be some time to take some questions. And what we usually do is we write these, write some words on the board. Actually, it's a small enough crowd. Let's do that. What do you think of when you think of Africa? Okay. So this is a uh, this is a fairly typical list of the kinds of words that I see when when I ask this uh, this question. Um, and the the places that we get these words from. Uh, we get these we get these perceptions uh, from the media, from the news that we read, from the movies we watch, from the music we listen to. Um, this is a particular project that's about photography, so I'm going to focus on that a little bit. <clears throat> Usually, when you think about Africa, and some of these words come up in your mind, and you think about that part of the world and the images you've seen, you probably are, are thinking about images that look a little bit like this. Or that. Or that. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ivory Coast uh, in West Africa. I can't reach it, but it's up there, I promise. Um, uh, I went to the Peace Corps in January of 1995. Uh, and so that means I basically spent all of 1994 making my application to the Peace Corps to become a Peace Corps volunteer. 1994 was a rather tumultuous year on the continent. Um, lots of things happened, but probably two things stick out. Um, in May, uh, April of 1994, there was the genocide in Rwanda. And in May of that year is when Nelson Mandela became president of South Africa. Um, so you have in one year, actually just a couple of months, sort of the worst possible thing imaginable, and something rather amazing happening. Um, I spent a lot of time that year because I knew the Peace Corps was coming, watching the news, trying to learn about other parts of the world. I saw these images in the news all that year, and that informed my uh, perception of what life was like in that part of the world. <clears throat> when I was told late in 1994 that I was going to be going to Ivory Coast, my reaction was, oh, Ivory Coast, great. Which country on the Ivory Coast? Um, I didn't have any idea that that was a country. I thought it was a region. Um, so when I, went to, when I got to Ivory Coast early in 1995, I learned pretty quickly that life in that part of the continent had nothing to do with either of the big stories that had been so present in my uh, imagination of that place uh, the year before. There was nothing having to do with genocide. There was nothing having to do with Nelson Mandela and the rainbow nation or any of those things. Um, I lived in Ivory Coast for two years in a small village in the northern part of the country. And after those two years, I moved to New York. I went to graduate school for international affairs. And then in early 2002, I moved back to West Africa, I moved back to Abidjan uh, as a journalist. And I was a freelancer for about five months. And while I was there, I got hired by the Associated Press. And I worked for the Associated Press in Ivory Coast covering West Africa. Now, covering West Africa for the, uh, for the AP at that time and still today meant a region that started up in Mauritania, which is up there near Morocco, kind of, and all the way down through the DRC. So that's a really big chunk of land. Um, I covered politics and conflict and elections and, and, and culture and all sorts of things in that region for almost two years. And uh, after I did that, I moved back to New York. Uh, a wire job is an amazing experience and a wonderful way to learn how to be a reporter. Um, but I decided I didn't want to do wire reporting. I wanted to try to, to, to do magazine uh, writing, uh, longer form stuff. So I came back to New York, uh, got back into the magazine industry, and then went back to the continent as often, often as I could to do my own reporting. So jump ahead to 2012, and this is when I got a grant from the Pulitzer Center to go to Western Ivory Coast with Peter DeCampo, a photographer with whom I'd worked a fair bit. And we went to the western part of the country to do a story on the way that that country was emerging from its conflict. It had been in the midst of a crisis for about 10 years, uh, which had begun when I was there in 2002, and was just coming out of that period of time. 
<clears throat> and so we were there to sort of see how things were going. We spent most of our time in the western part of the country where the fighting was heaviest, uh, near the Liberian border. And um, I'll show you some of the pictures we took while we were there. So this is, in broad brushstrokes, what the war was about. <clears throat> that's chocolate. And that's pure chocolate. So that is when you have a cocoa pod, and you break open the cocoa pod and spread the beans out on the ground to dry, and then you ferment them, and then you process them, and crush them, and cook them, and you come up with a, a kind of a paste. Um, so that is pure liquid cocoa. And that's what is the main ingredient in, in chocolate. Ivory Coast is the world's top producer of cocoa. They produce 40% of the world's crop. Uh, Brazil and Ghana, I think, are in second and third place back at like 20%. So they're, they're, they're the largest producer of cocoa by a wide margin. And because cocoa is such a prized commodity and so valuable and such an important part of the economy, um, land is an important part of what people are concerned with in Ivory Coast. And so the war was in many ways a land fight. Um, Ivory Coast was for a long time the most stable country in that part of West Africa. And for 30 years, as the rest of the, the region sort of had a hard time emerging from colonialism, um, it was sort of a bastion of peace and stability and um, economic uh, wealth. So. People came in from neighboring countries. They came in, oh, the map's not there anymore. Um, people came in from neighboring countries. They came in from Guinea and from Liberia and from Ghana and from Burkina Faso and from Mali, and they came in to work the land. Uh, the president of Ivory Coast, the first president of Ivory Coast, Félix Houphouët Boigny, uh, had a famous saying where he, he basically advertised to the region, uh, come, uh, it, the land belongs to he who works it. So basically an open invitation to anyone in the region who wants to come here and work the land, and you may have that land and prosper from it. And so because of that, lots of people came into the country, and they got along quite well for a long time, until eventually those folks began to become well off in a way that some of the locals were not. Um, the economy took a dive uh, at, at a couple of different times. And so eventually you ended up having a lot of disagreement over the ownership of, of uh, those cocoa plantations. And that had a lot to do with why the war uh, was being fought. So that is a, a, a photograph of um, pure cocoa in a cocoa plant in the western part of the country. Uh, this is another photograph of that facility. And this is a, uh, at the port in San Pedro, um, several pallets of cocoa beans getting ready to be shipped off to the west. And some of the guys in the cocoa processing plant, plant who um, were talking with us during um, while we were there. But we were there to, to, to talk about this conflict. And so we went around Western Ivory Coast, and we took pictures of the kinds of things you would imagine a journalist in that position would take pictures of. And we interviewed those people as well. So we went to a displaced persons camp in the western part of the country, which was set up by UNHCR. And we spoke with people in this village that had been destroyed uh, in fighting that happened about two weeks before we arrived. And we spoke with this woman and a couple of others. Uh, she had been raped by soldiers during the fighting. And we went to the border with Liberia, and we had meant to go into Liberia and try to visit some of the Ivorians living, living in the refugee camps in uh, eastern Liberia. But instead, we stopped at the border, and we met a, a convoy of refugees coming home. And we followed them home, and they were going home for the first time uh, in a year. And when they got home, there was frequently a lot of rejoicing, uh, people that had not seen each other in a year or more. But then they would go to their homes for the first time and frequently discover that they had been torn down or destroyed in the fighting. These are traditional hunters in the western part of the country who had been conscripted into militias and a uh, home that had been burned down. This was an important story and a story that we were very committed to uh, writing about and photographing. And it was an underreported story. It's a part of the world that doesn't get a whole lot of attention. So we were very committed to trying to get this story out there. And yet, while we were there doing this work, we each experienced a, gr a high level of frustration that we were basically uh, contributing to 
um, a stereotype of that part of the world. I had lived in Ivory Coast for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer, for two years as a reporter at the AP, and then had been back there many times. Peter had been a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana, and had lived in Ghana for about three or four years after that, and had traveled through much of West Africa as well. And we knew that life wasn't really like this all the time. And we were frustrated that there was no way to sort of tell that story. So while we were doing our reporting on the story, we began to take some other pictures, the two of us together. So as you might notice, the, there are a couple of things that are different about these images. One is their content. These are photographs of everyday life, people doing normal things, not having to do with conflict or poverty or disease. And the other is their look. These photographs were all taken with Peter's very fancy professional cameras. These were all taken with this. So this is all cell phone photography now. This is the first picture of everyday Africa. And we were in an elevator riding up to, the, um, to get our press passes in the main city of Abidjan. And while we were in the elevator, Peter saw this scene. And he wanted to take this picture with the man and the lights above him and the reflection in the, in the mirror and so forth. But he didn't want to get in trouble yet because we didn't have our, our badges. So he took his phone out and took it that way instead. We went to a local shopping mall to buy cell phones, and this is the woman where we bought who was running the store. A couple guys, car mechanics on the side of the road. This is a woman who was uh, working at the reception desk at the hotel where we stayed for a few days in the western part of the country. One of our favorite, favorite breakfast stands. Those commercials you see on TV, for 50 cents a day, you can save the life of a poor African child. So Peter went to take a picture of this child, and it was as if his father could tell that, or feared that that's why this picture was being taken. And he was running over there to say, you're not taking a picture of this kid with his nose running. So he ran over there to wipe his nose just as Peter started to take the picture, but didn't put his cigarette out. So the photograph I showed you earlier of the convoy coming back from Liberia, um, those refugees were sitting just a few feet from where this photograph was taken. And the difference with this image is that the refugees on their way home, they got a living allowance from the UN um, so that they could sort of get their lives back together. And some of the folks were using that money to buy DVDs from a vendor on the side of the road so that when they got home, they could have a movie to watch. And this guy was in a village uh, that we spent a lot of time in. There was a lot of fighting. That road behind him divided the village. The village was called Niambli between uh, the northern side, which is where the locals lived, and the southern side, which is where uh, uh, foreigners, people who were not from uh, that part of, not necessarily foreigners to the country, but foreigners to that region, um, lived. <clears throat> we spent a lot of time there because one half of the village had been destroyed and the other half had, had been completely uh, saved from any trouble. And so we were talking to a lot of the people about why that was true and what had happened and the ethnic differences and so forth. This guy wanders up and he's from the village and so we wanted to ask him these questions too. But he doesn't live in the village anymore, he lives in Abidjan. And all he wanted to talk about was the music scene and the nightclubs he goes to and the, his uh, favorite uh, artists and so forth. So he was interesting in that regard for everyday Africa. And also, I live in Brooklyn, and this guy could be my neighbor. I mean, he's got that urban hipster thing very much down, with the t-shirt that's a little bit too small for you, et cetera. And so we started Everyday Africa. <clears throat> everyday Africa, at first, was simply a Tumblr blog and a Facebook page for the two of us to share images with one another. Uh, soon after that Ivory Coast trip in uh, March of 2012, uh, uh, Peter got an assignment to go to Uganda for a few weeks. I got an assignment to go to Nigeria and Zambia and Zimbabwe. And while we were in those countries, we continued to take pictures. We were able to, to share those images with each other. 
And soon other friends and colleagues got in touch who wanted to also use this outlet to be able to tell the stories they were seeing. They had the same frustrations that we did, that, the, that their work was contributing to the stereotype that Africa is nothing but a place of these things. So that's how Everyday, Everyday Africa began. Um, soon we had about a dozen photographers and we were um, representing more and more of the, of the continent. Um, today we have about, there are about 35 photographers who have contributed to the project and there are about a dozen right now who are active and of those dozen, probably eight or, eight or so are African photographers and we've moved more into a, um, a managerial uh, kind of role. <clears throat> Um, so the word exercise that we started off with, we have done classroom talks with, mostly with high school students, but some at the university level, um, in, largely in Chicago, in New York City, and in Washington, D.C. So last year we saw more than 2,000 students, and we, and we usually start with this word exercise to try to see what people's perceptions are. And you, know, you can see the kind of list that we had tonight. Um, this was a list from Chicago, the first time that we did this. And this was a list from this afternoon in one of the classes here. So a few things about these word lists. One is that it's, it's discouraging and it's depressing to see these kinds of words. And yet, at the same time, it's also evidence that we're not making this up. These perceptions are out there. These are the things that pop into people's heads when they hear the word Africa. So there's plenty of room to have a conversation and to talk about misperceptions and stereotypes and, and the ways in which this part of the world is perceived by us through the media and through other places. Incidentally, there's a new uh, film that's coming out soon that um, I learned about when I was in Kenya last month. And it's a film that is being produced by Angelina Jolie. <clears throat> and it is about Richard Leakey, who's an important paleoanthropologist who's spent a lot of his life working in the northern part of, of Kenya. And it's a, it, the, the film focuses on his life in the 80s when he um, convinced the Kenyan government to burn a large pile of ivory tusks in an effort to try to stop elephant poaching. Um, he went on to be a very important politician and, and activist and, and still is working actively in the northern part of the country mostly. Um, he's an important man. He's an interesting man. He's a perfectly good subject for a movie to be made about him. But it's a movie about that one man in that one country about that one subject, elephant poaching. And I'll just ask you, do you have any idea what the name of the movie is going to be? I know some of you know because I've seen you the last few days. The working title for the movie is Africa, which is a little bit silly. It would be kind of like going and making a movie about panda bears and calling it Asia or something like that. Um, we ran, uh, with these education workshops, for the first time we managed to do a, an international version of this in Kenya last month. And uh, it was linking up a high school in Mombasa on the coast of Kenya with a high school on the north side of Chicago. And so I flew to Chicago and I worked with the kids there and introduced the concept to them and sort of instructed them on, on how to take photographs with their cell phones that to told true stories of their lives. Because Chicago's got its own uh, stereotypes that it's burdened with. Um, we introduced the kids to each other via Skype, and then I flew to Kenya where Peter already was, and we met up with the kids there, and we ran a workshop there with those students for about six days. And the students interacted with one another via Skype several times, and they produced photo essays to talk about their part of the world, to talk about what life is really like in trying to rise above these stereotypes. So we always did this sort of word association game, and one thing, one slide I wanted to show you was a word cloud that shows of the 2,000 kids that we saw in the States last year, what are the kinds of things people are saying. Uh, and we would have, sometimes I would write the words on the board like this, and sometimes we'd have the students write the words on paper and hand them in. So we had a, a large sample. So here's the word cloud 
of what the um, here's the word cloud of what the American students over the past year thought about Africa. And there's a couple of things in there that are that are maybe a little bit hard to see, <clears throat> but. So you have Ebola very big, but you also, in addition to Ebola, have disease and malaria and HIV. So it's not just Ebola. Um, also, interestingly, AIDS is very small. It's hiding there underneath the A in Ebola. But it's a list that looks a whole lot like this list. Then we asked the kids in Mombasa to give us lists of words about what they thought of their own continent. And this is what they said. So there's some overlap there. You know, there are some similar words in a, in a few places, but the context is entirely different. You see poverty in both places. You see wildlife in both places. But the words that surround the larger words are far different, by and large. Then we asked the, the kids in Mombasa to give us uh, word associations of what they think of the US. I don't know if you can see, but right underneath developed is the word Kardashian. And I also thought it was interesting that up there above New York is the word Russia. So these misperceptions go both ways. This is not as malinformed as our list of our perceptions of that part of the world. But there's still some exaggeration. The point being, of course, that there's plenty of room to, uh, for exchange and to, and to learn a bit about, about one another. So if everyday Africa is not supposed to be primarily showing photographs that talk about these kinds of things. What are we trying to say? Well, we're trying to say that in Africa, people belong to marching bands. And they go to work in scientific labs. And they rollerblade. And they play in swimming pools. And get married. And they play with toy airplanes. And study for exams in a room that looks a lot like this one. And they go to football games. Soccer. They care about fashion. And they go to the beach. And they take cell phone photographs of each other at the beach. And they make paintings. And go to concerts. and get their pictures taken for the yearbook. And they go to nightclubs and play golf and vote in elections. And they do laundry and play polo. And they celebrate one year wedding anniversaries. And they audition for movies, and go fishing, and they stare at solar eclipses. And I think any of those photographs could have been taken pretty much anywhere. So we're not trying to say that bad things don't happen. It's about context. 
one of the nice things about Instagram is there's a stream of photography. So in the stream of photography, you can see a picture of something uh, of a kid in a slum, for example. But next to that photograph will be a photograph like one of these. And so you have some context that gives you a better and deeper understanding of what life is really like in that part of the world. So we do have pictures like a child is a refugee in a camp in Congo. Or a man has been persecuted against for being gay in Uganda. Or a community that's suffering from Ebola. Or a farming family that's having a hard time getting by in the DRC. But again, as I said, it's about context. You know, this is the only photo that you see in the news. You don't see the other photograph. So you don't have as much of an idea of what life is like in a broader kind of way. Another interesting thing that's happened with this project is that there's been a lot of commentary. So we have about 130,000 followers on Instagram now. And there's been a lot of commentary. People will say things, a wide range of things, from the innocent to the ignorant to the very racist sometimes. Um, we try to stay out of these conversations. We just sort of let the followers kind of hash it out. And it's always fascinating to see how that goes. So a couple examples of that. This is a photograph of a girl reading a book, waiting for a book bus in uh, Abidjan and Ivory Coast. And someone leaves a comment, would you do such a picture of a French girl? What's so astonishing about a girl reading a book in Ivory Coast? And another, another person responds, I'm not sure where your outrage comes from. It wasn't presented as astonishing that she was reading. It's simply a photo of everyday life in Ivory Coast, much like the rest in this series. And a similar photo of a French girl would be an interesting and equally compelling image. This is a picture of a girl taking a bath in Ghana. And someone left the remark, it's a beautiful picture, but a sad context. And the response is, why is it sad? She's bathing organically, has clean water to do so, is in the sunshine, and heading to school. Please stop assuming that because, you're, because life looks different than yours, it's tragic. The... Um, the everyday Africa feed sort of sparked something that we had not really anticipated. It became a bit of a, it's become a bit of a phenomenon across Instagram. And there are numerous other everyday projects now. About a year and a half ago, we noticed Everyday Asia. And these are all feeds that are sort of trying to do the same kind of thing. They're using cell phone photography, usually cell phone photography, to talk about um, tell stories about what life is really like in these parts of the world. Everyday Bronx was begun by us. We ran a workshop in the Bronx with some middle school kids. And at the end of that project, we used the photographs they had taken to start this uh, feed. And now it's being run by a collective of professional photographers in the southern part of the Bronx. And so they are now sort of managing that operation, taking the pictures, and also working with students in that community. Everyday Latin America started just about eight months ago. Everyday Middle East. Everyday Iran is one of the more interesting ones. So a lot of these feeds work the way that Everyday Africa does, which means that we have a list of contributing photographers. And those folks, are they have the login information to the Instagram feed. And they can go online, and they can post an image whenever they feel like they've got one that makes sense for the project. <clears throat> Everyday Iran is different. They're, this is a, a group of three or four um, curators, and they are looking on Instagram using hashtags, so people who have hashtagged their work, Everyday Iran, and that's how they choose their photographs to go onto the feed. And it's really a, a, an absolutely fascinating uh, look at that part of the world. It's not just uh, regional or geographic um, projects. There are also issue-based projects. Everyday Incarceration uh, started just a couple of months ago, which is an attempt to look at the prison culture of this country and not only to talk about what life is like in prisons and for people who are incarcerated, but also what that experience has done, what that event has done to their families back home. And Everyday Climate Change was started by James Whitlow Delano, who spoke here last year, right? We spoke here last year. So 
Back to the word list. When I do this exercise sometimes with high school students, and it's just a, a few minutes in class or you know, half an hour or an hour long workshop where we go outside and take some pictures and do some things like this, and we start with this sort of word association game. Even just after that one hour, uh, frequently you'll find that people are changing their minds already about how they, they perceive life in Africa. So that first picture I showed you, hunger, poverty, bad, no water, war, dry, giraffe. After just an hour, they already were coming up with a new list of words. Growth, familiar, strong, interesting, innovative, original. So one of our hopes here is that the we're starting a nonprofit, and we're starting a nonprofit called the Everyday Projects. And the Everyday Projects will be sort of an umbrella organization that provides assistance to all these other feeds as, uh, as necessary and, and, and as possible. Uh, we'll do some fundraising and have all kinds of different uh, ways of trying to get the word out about that. Um, <clears throat> but the, the element of this that we're most dedicated to is the education aspect. Um, the Getting to do talks like this is, is a fantastic experience, and I'm glad to be able to get the word out. Uh, but when you're talking usually with, with students in high school, it seems to have even more impact, because these impressions of this part of the world started in early age. And so if we can get out into these classrooms and get these students to go out and use their cell phones, you know, it's an everyday device to take everyday pictures of everyday life and share them with the world, then I think it's a sort of a start toward uh, helping change misperceptions of not just Africa, but also of um, these other countries, these other regions, and the town in which you live. Uh, this summer, uh, Professor Olson is going to have a class called Everyday South Dakota. Um, and you can go out and you can take part in that and you can take photographs of this community here and tell true stories about what life is like here and tell people like me who live in New York City what life is really like in South Dakota. So our feeling is that through this project, there really is a lot of uh, possibility. And the overarching Instagram feed for all of it is Everyday Everywhere. And through Everyday Everywhere, we're able to not only show the highlights of the everyday photographs from all of the everyday projects, but also uh, have used this as an opportunity to share photography by anyone who's using that hashtag as a way of getting anyone who wants to participate involved. So if you take a picture down the street and you, it's a good photograph and it's telling an interesting story of someone's life <clears throat> here in Brookings, and you hashtag it every day, everywhere, it will be seen by the curators and possibly included uh, in this feed. So that's our hope, and um, thanks a lot for having me.